Sunday morning, church. Uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there's redemption, there's healing, there's power, and there's joy. So will you stand with us? We're going to sing out of that place of joy this morning. Instead of pain, there's freedom though you've captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. Oh, there's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you've joy instead of mourning. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul.
Hey, we're glad you're here. We hope you got to worship God on your way in. If this is your first time with us, we, the most important thing to us is that you would fill out that Connect card. Uh, we want this to feel like home for you. We want to know who you are, and we want to thank you for joining us, reaching out to you, introducing ourselves, figuring out how we can plug you in. So if you would do that before you leave today, uh, you can do it by scanning a QR code or filling it out by hand. Um, the rest of the stuff on the worship guide lets you know things that are coming up. Just a continual reminder, um, we have an Alcoholics Anonymous group that's meeting here on Thursdays. That is much bigger than just our church body. So if you know someone that would benefit, please extend that invite. That is an open invitation. Um, also, along the same lines, we do also have free marriage and family therapy and counseling available through our church. Um, we have business cards in the office and at least in the women's bathroom. I can't tell you if we have those in the men's or not, but uh, we want you to know that that's a service that we can extend to you if you need that. Um, and then today is Move Up Sunday. Today is our students are moving up or promoting to their next grade in accordance with the school year. So um, there's lots of fun planned in the back for them. So if you have a child that's worshiping with us now and is going to be released shortly, expect them to have a really exciting day back there in kids' ministry. Um, let's continue in our worship. We're going to declare this morning who he is, who we believe him to be, the power of the Trinity. Leave 
no sweeter name. Jesus, the one who makes a way when there seems to be no way. The one who keeps his promises from beginning to end. Who's never failed us yet. The one who works miracles in our lives and all around us. Some that are big, some that we have to declare are of him and some that are little and we're oblivious and yet he's still at work. The one who's a light in the darkness. And if that's you this morning, if you are living stuck in the darkness of depression or you know the darkness of some struggle, whether that's addiction, um, we just offer that up to him this morning. On behalf of you, that is the community of Christ, that when we come together, there's power. So God, we lay those things before you, and if that's the person next to us or in front of us or behind us, we pray on their behalf this morning that you would be the light in their darkness. God, that you would be working miracles in a way that causes us to, you know, just cry out and declare your name and your glory and your goodness. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop. Oh, you never stop, you never stop. Even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop. No, you never stop. Even when, even when you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're even when even when i don't feel it you're yes, you working. never stop you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop Is he not worthy? Yes. Give me my hand and let's move into a time of prayer this morning. Thank you. Thank you, worship team, for uh, leading us before the Lord in such a tremendous way. Uh, really opens our hearts to receive what God has for us today. God, you are the way, way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. You never stop working. Thank you, Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with all my heart, and I will praise his holy name. So, Lord, we do humbly come before you and give you praise and honor and glory. For you alone, you alone are our God, our Savior, and our sustainer. You alone are worthy of our praise and worship. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for sending your son to pay for our sins. We are so unworthy. But because of your love for us, you sent Jesus and he willingly came and gave his life so that we could live eternally with you. Father, again, I just thank you for being able to establish a relationship with the God of this universe. I also want to bring thanks that uh, for many other things, but especially for bringing Ryan and Kara back to us safe. We pray that they are refreshed and uh, ready to uh, lead this church in the direction that you would have us to go. We also pray for the staff at our church that work behind the scenes and do all that they do to see that uh, the Lord's work is done here. 
And so I pray a special blessing upon them as they continue to serve this church body so, so faithfully. And Lord, I, I just want to bring those that are, that are sick and that are, uh, <clears throat> need a touch from you, Lord. We just uh, pray especially for Susan Weaver this morning and pray for Tracy for strength as, as they uh, are, are going through some trying times in their, uh, in, in their life. And there's many others, Lord, that I'm not aware of, but uh, those of you that are in this congregation know many. Uh, so if you just take a short minute and lift those before the Lord, we'll have a moment of silence. Lord, as we bring those people to your attention, Lord, that you would uh, receive our prayer requests. And uh, Lord, if it be your will that uh, they would be healed, but we will trust you, Lord, that your will be done in all that, is, that happens in our lives. <clears throat> Help us, Lord, to respond to the leading of your Holy Spirit. As you bring opportunities before us, to share your love <clears throat> with those uh, that uh, you have arranged div divine appointments with um, as, as we cross paths. A simple smile, a hug, a listening ear. Um, Lord, just help us to respond to those nudges that you've given to us. Lord, as we uh, prepare now for to have Brian come and speak with us Lord we pray a special blessing upon him and what you have laid on his heart and Lord we pray for open ears and, and minds and hearts that we receive what you would have him to speak to us this morning we just pray now that you would be with him as he opens, his, opens the word before us in Jesus name Amen Your mission, Jim, should you decide to accept it. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Good morning, everybody. Did that jack you up? You ready? <laughs> Is everybody like, ready for Mission Impossible? Good, it's good to see all of you. You know, out of all the seasons of the year, maybe Christmas and Easter is such an exciting time. This time, August and September, is one of the most exciting times for our church because there's such an influx of people. So as I look out here, I see all these new faces. Uh, I'm glad everybody's here, but especially to the new folks who are new to Westview over these few weeks, we're glad you're here too. My name is Brian, I'm our lead pastor, and uh, one thing I want to focus on a little bit this week, too, is students, because we know students are really rolling in. We're going to focus on that a little bit later in the service, too, but we're glad you're here. I would want to take just a moment also and invite those, uh, thank those who are online. Uh, we're glad you're with us, and it's kind of cool as we look around and we see this mosaic of people as Westview kind of, it's, it's a fun church because it's always changing. So we're glad, we're glad you're all here. Let me take just a moment out and, and mention that one of the student body groups that come in every year are international students. There's, there's between like 2,000 and 3,000 mainly graduate students that come into Manhattan and come into Kansas State University. And when they land here, they literally land here with just their luggage. And they're like, they're going into an apartment or a place to live. And, and so they have this big furniture giveaway. And it happened just this weekend where they walk into this big lot on K-State's campus and there's all these furnishings to help them get a start. And they're free. And there was a good group of our people that were there yesterday that helped them pick load and take it to their house. So those who are there from our church representing Westview that helped with the International Student Furniture Giveaway, would you raise your hand kind of big and would you give them a big round of applause because they, they represent us there. 
But I think this is really important too. The helping international student ministry is very important to us at Westview that every international student that lands here has an American friend. It, it pairs them with American friends. And Joyce shared with me this morning there are still 30, 30 international students that have arrived here. They're looking for that American friend. So would you pray about this? Would you consider, there are a lot of uh, international students here in our body because people are friends with them and, and just help them get settled in. So would you pray about that? And if you are interested in making sure that all 30 are gobbled up by the end of the service, all you have to do is fill out, like, write on this connect card, write, hey, would you, I'm very interested in helping international students, write that, drop it in our box, and we'll make sure we get you connected. But let's not leave any of them alone, amen? Oh boy, you can do much better than that. I think the online people were louder than you. Give me a big amen. amen. Thank you. On our worship guide, that was a really good one. Everybody should amen like that. On our worship guide, when you walked in to our guests, this is kind of what's hot and happening around here. On the back of these sermon notes, we're going to go into God's word together. This is kind of an outline of what we're talking about, the main points today. So you can follow along with that. And to our guests, this Connect card is really important. We would love it, especially if you're just visiting or if you're looking for a church home, take a second, write your name on here, scan the QR code, fill it online, um, give us an email address or phone number, and you can take it to our welcome center at the end of the service or drop it in the box by the door. But Pastor Wayne or I would love to reach out to you and say, can we help you on this journey finding a church home? So, all right, that's a lot to start out, but would you open your Bibles with me, your paper Bibles, your electronic Bibles? I'd like you to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. That's where we're going to be today, in just a key part of Scripture right there. So Revelation chapter 2, if you're unfamiliar a little bit with that, it is the last book of the Bible. We always say it's, a, it's the exciting part of God's great plan that is still yet to come. And so, book of Revelation chapter 2, uh, I'm going to catch everybody up in case you missed last week. We started this new series, Mission Possible, not Impossible. I know we flashed back. <laughs> there was a TV series, and I was horrified this morning when I Googled, when did that TV series start growing up? It was 1966, is when Mission Impossible TV, that was the year I was born. I was like, oh, I thought that was the 70s or 80s. But now, Tom Cruise and all them kind of run with the Mission Impossible theme, and so they've had six movies, and there's two more coming, so I am up to date. For those of you who think, I only think in the 60s or 70s, I am up to date, but that's our series, Mission Possible. And last week, we started with that. We're talking about mission, the M word. And the first week, we talked about, well, what is mission? And we blew up the idea that it's just these professional people that we all raise money and pray for and send around the world. We said mission, its very meaning as a word is both of this. It is to send and be sent. They're both in that word. And what we said is mission is really the movement of God's love. It's first in Trinity. God's love long before the earth ever existed. God's love moved from the Father to the Son and the Holy Spirit. They worked and they, they, there's a dance as that love and movement of, uh, of movement of love works amongst them. And then God went into creation through Jesus and he extends that love through humanity. And so it's a movement. Mission is a movement of God's love. And then we said when you open this Bible, the grand narrative from the first book to the last book is that movement of God's love. It is the Bible. Mission is the grand narrative. It started with Adam and Eve and God's love and moved towards them when sin entered the world. And then God's love moved through Abraham as he became and started what we call the great nation of Israel. And then God's love and movement was from Israel as it extended to the rest of the world and drew the world to God through this little postage stamp country in the world. And then we have Jesus, God's movement of love is through Jesus, and so we're following now into the Gospels and the New Testament, and then Jesus pays that price, rises up, and gives that mission, that movement of God to the church. And now we carry that movement of love to the rest of the world. It's the grand narrative, but we also said mission is from God, it originates from Him, and it's an attribute of Him. And since we're in His image, it's us too. That was <laughs> just last week. We talked about joining that dance and we gave you a challenge. I think we used Leanne Womack's song. When it comes to mission as a church, you can sit it out or you can dance and join God in the dance with the Holy Spirit and through the Son and join that dance. If you missed that first sermon, you can go out on our YouTube channel or you can also catch us online and check out our website through there if you want to get caught up. So last week we just set fundamentally what is mission? This week we're talking about, well, what is mission then to us, the church? And so we're gonna take a deep dive in that. 
But to do that, I kind of overwhelmed you with a lot of stuff. I'm going to just kind of do a little thing here. I want you to close your eyes because I want you to clear your minds out for just a second because I want you to think of something that helps, helps you join into the heart of this sermon. So close your eyes. Quit thinking about the kids and the chaos of getting here today. Um, see if you can just sell your heart and be open-minded as I ask this first big question. Who was your first love? There's a question. Who was your first love? Could have been in third grade, high school, college. Who was your first love? Can I bring that to mind? Now open your eyes. My first love, you notice I'm not looking at my wife because I think I'm going to be in trouble here. My first love was Marilyn Bloom. Okay. <laughs> It was in kindergarten. So Marilyn Bloom, um, and I was, <laughs> I hope she's not watching us online. I don't think she watches us online. I don't think she knew this. Marilyn Bloom in kindergarten was my first love, and I remember I wanted to express my love to Marilyn one day in class, and so this was what I did. So you can imagine, I, I took these from the children's ministry area, but, but we had these bigger cardboard building blocks, and I thought, well, I'm gonna express my love to Marilyn Bloom by building something for her. So if you can imagine these just in a larger scale, because at five years old, everything was big, right? So I built this bridge, it looked something like this. So I built this bridge, and probably it was like this tall or whatever, and I built this, and expressed my love for Marilyn, I said, why don't you walk across the bridge? <laughs> So Marilyn gets up and starts walking across the bridge. Now, many of us know in kindergarten, none of us have had construction science yet, right? <laughs> so this was not built very well. So like you can imagine, Marilyn got to the top and it all collapsed. And Marilyn came down. I don't know where I was. I was just in proximity to it. And Marilyn came down into me. We both came down into the cupboard. And the cupboard was full of potted plants. And potted plants went flying. And crash. Everything just a big crash in the kindergarten class. All I know is I was expressing my love to Marilyn. Next thing I know, we're covered in potting soil. <laughs> and this is real. This really happened. And, and you know the trauma sometimes of first love? Marilyn got to go to the bathroom and wash up. I had to go sit in my seat the rest of the day. My penance was I was covered in potting soil the rest of the day. I remember that trauma of my first love in expressing the bridge that collapsed. So, but remember your first love? And do you remember kind of what that did to your behavior? Do you remember what you did that first love? Do you remember how it kind of acted, made you act in ways that probably you never acted before? Do you remember you just was so occupied thinking about him or her? Do you remember that you probably in the old days you passed notes, today you texted endlessly? Not that many years ago you ran out of texting minutes. <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. Remember how infatuated? I'd love to hear, and those are online can even type it, I'd love to hear, but we don't have time today, just like how did you even go crazy? Like what crazy thing did you do? because we all probably did something a little crazy. Do you remember the first time you fell in love with your Savior, Jesus? Do you remember how it changed your behavior? Do you remember like you couldn't stop when you realized somebody paid their life for you and loved you that much and gave you new life now? Do you remember awakening to that? Do you remember, do you remember that you probably couldn't pray enough? You probably couldn't get in the Bible enough? You probably couldn't be in community enough? You just wanted to absorb and you probably couldn't shut up about him and people thought you were a Jesus freak or whatever? Maybe some of us went through that. The Bible talks about this first love but it doesn't reference really individuals or couples but the Bible references the whole church. So I want you, right there in the book of Revelation, chapter two, we're gonna start here. This is early in the book of Revelation. What's happening here is that at this point is that Jesus himself, or the risen Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father, is giving a vision to the apostle John as he writes this book. And the first thing that he asks in the book of Revelation is, John, I want you to write down these letters to these seven churches. These seven new Christian churches have launched. The first letter is to the church in Ephesus. 
Now, this probably isn't a building, a big church. It's probably all the home churches that existed at that time. And so this church is written to a community, uh, or that's why this letter is written to a community of churches. It's written, the book of Revelation is written in about 95 AD. So knowing that the church of Ephesus was planned maybe 10 years after Jesus' uh, death and resurrection, that this, the, the church of Ephesus might be in her second generation at this time when they receive this letter. And so Jesus says, John, I want you to write these words. So the words we're looking at are the very words that Jesus is asking John to scribe and write to the church in Ephesus. Uh, interestingly enough, um, Ephesus is in modern day Turkey. Uh, Ephesus church is not, I don't know if you can even find a Christian church in, in all of Turkey today. So Revelation 2, starting in verse one. Imagine this is coming directly from Jesus. Not imagine it is, so. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. Write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and you're bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So let's look at the scripture together a little bit. Jesus through a vision, scribe, John's a scribe, writing this down, write this letter first, the church in Ephesus. Jesus says, you know, to, to the angel of the church, we, I don't know, there's a lot of different viewpoints of this, but, but, but we largely believe there's an angelic presence over that church, guides, protects, and also there's Jesus who walks among the lampstand. Now, a golden lampstand is a description that you see throughout the Bible, uh, that now you see in the Bible in the Revelation, it's the church. The church is the golden lampstand. It's gold, it's pure, but it gives light, right? It is showing the light. And so it's a neat to have that representation. So it's saying Jesus who, who walks amongst the lampstands. So what should make you really excited is, may, is that we should be comfortable that we have angelic presence and that Jesus is walking amongst us right now. He's here. He's not out there. He says, John, write this down. And, and the first thing that Jesus does is says nine encouraging things. Wouldn't you love right now for Jesus to say, let me give you nine encouraging things about Westview. Nine encouraging things. Your works, your toil, you're tough on those who are evil. You've not grown weary. Super encouraging. What's my favorite word in the Bible? But. We get to verse four. The word but, whenever it shows up, there's a major change or dramatic shift. He says, but, you've done all these great things, but you lost your first love. So what is first love? A lot of people argue about what this is or maybe discuss this theologically. I think it's simple, knowing the apostle John, knowing Jesus, knowing the great commandment to love God with everything you got and love your neighbor yourself. They lost that motivation in what they were doing the motivation of loving God with everything they got and loving their neighbor. At the heart of this, their first love is a great commandment was no longer their motivation for everything they did and they were doing a lot of stuff. So let's look at our first sermon note together. The signs of lost love that you see here, doing church instead of being church. They were doing church they were no longer being church. They were doing theology and activity well. They were working, they were toiling, they were tough on those who were evil. They are doing theology and activity well, but they lost their joy, they lost their fervor because they lost their love. They were just going through the motions. The church became a checklist. They loved Bible study. They loved taking on false leaders, but they had lost their love for God through Jesus, a love that compelled them to love others. Now understand the second generation of this church as, as, as Roman rule and Christianity has taken on more heat, this church is under a lot of pressure. But Jesus also, if we jump over, if you write next to that note, write Matthew 24, verse 12. Right, Matthew, if they're on your notes, write Matthew 24. Jesus is talking, 
in the Gospel of Matthew to his disciples here. And he's, for, he's forecasting what's going to come for the church. And Jesus says this to them. He says, sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus says, when you go out and plant those churches, sin will be rampant. It'll be a battle. Don't let your love grow cold. Losing that first love in the church is losing our mission. So let's look at our, our next sermon note. In comparison for today, and we look at the church of Ephesus, the church today is losing her first love. Now I'm going to be a little bit critical for a little bit. But I think it's really important that we face up to these statistics and what's going on. Some of this is not, we've talked about it before, but the broader Christian church in the West, when we talk about Europe and America, but I want to drill in just on America. The broader Western church here today has been on a steady slide downward since the 1980s. There are no more Christians today, even though our population has increased by millions than it was in the 1980s. As a matter of fact, it's gone the other direction. Barna Group, uh, who I love reading because they really study the impact of Christianity and faith. They're one of the best. Uh, this is a recent study. They said only 46%, 46%, less than half of Christians that they surveyed believe mission is a mandate for the church. What that means is only 46% of Christians in America believe that the movement of God's love from us to the others is actually a mandate that we have to do that. 46%. Pastors, 85%. That number should be 100%. And so the words of Matthew, Jesus and Matthew, the sin is rampant everywhere around us today and the love in the church has grown cold in many places. Your next sermon, I think there's two kinds of churches that we look, that we look at today that kind of lose their way. These are general descriptions that I think these are two major issues. Why does Brian know this? I serve on a team, I lead a team of revitalization pastors who, who engage churches who lose their first love. It's exactly what we do. And they want to get that first love back, but they culturally have changed. And it's, so our, our goal is we go in and we help churches find that first love again. And here's kind of what I see commonly around us in the churches is the first kind of church that lost their way is the isolated church, what I would call the isolated church. The isolated church is one that loves its members, but very little else. The isolated church is the one that looks at the world out there and is scared by it, so it builds up the walls and it hunkers down. The isolated church likes homogenous church. They like attracting people like them, they're not good at crossing cultural barriers and reaching people not like them. The isolated church, the first love is long gone for God and his commandment to be a movement of love to others. They only have love for themselves. I might say, Brian, that's a little harsh. A statistic that maybe you've ever heard here before is, is this number varies what you're looking at, but normally two-thirds or greater of the churches in America have had no evangelical growth. That means no baptisms, no change in status in over five or ten years. They're plateaued or stagnant. They lost their first love. As I look around, I don't care what denomination it is. As I look around, I see a lot of churches of a lot of gray-haired people that are down to about 30 people and they're all over 70. There's not a single kid's playground there. There's nothing. They quit reaching. They, they lost their first love a long time ago. And they're only a few funerals away from closing. So there's the isolated church. The next, is, the next kind of church is what we would call the indistinctive church. The indistinctive church is out there. It's out in the culture. It's engaging it, but they're not distinctive. And what that means is that they're out there, they're engaging the cultural norms, they're engaging the world, but they're becoming like it. And there's nothing distinctive about them that shows that our people are holy. They're different. They affirm behaviors, they affirm culture, and their church becomes like that.
and the church ends up being just like the world around it and the church loves the world more than it loves the distinctiveness of God's holiness that we're called to. Those are two general categories. I'm sure you can make up other ones. Those are two general categories of what we see in the slide. Lost love. In that mission possible bumper video we, we showed there, um, if you go back to the 60s, the TV show, or you go back to the movies now with Tom Cruise and everybody, the premise of Mission Impossible is there's evil in the world, but these special elite agents, the mission's impossible, but they take it on. It always becomes Mission Impossible. They go out and defeat evil. And every time they get a mission, it comes in kind of secretly, right, through a tape recorder and through or through a telephone or whatever. They get the secret mission. And every time they get the mission, like this is your mission, should you choose to accept it? What happens? What does it say right after that? This message will self-destruct in five seconds. And whenever I hear that, it reminds me of this next sermon note. The church will self-destruct if she ignores her mission. If the church becomes inward focused, it will never grow, it will never expand, and it always will die. Lifeway Research said in 2019, 3,700 churches in America closed. And we're not starting new churches at that rate. 3,700 churches in America closed in 2019. Now you're saying, well, that's COVID. That's the start of COVID. I don't even know what that number is now with COVID hitting and impacting those churches that were already on life support. That number is probably going to be much more substantial. The church will self-destruct if she ignores her mission. If the Church of America and the world today is isolated or indistinctive, she will self-destruct. The isolated church, like I said, will just be a few funerals away from closing as they become smaller and smaller, as they kind of shore up and hide in fear. The indistinctive church, uh, what will happen is sin and disunity will come in a church because they're accepting all the different behaviors, but it also will become weak and helpless as they watch their community collapse around them because they won't have the answer for change. If you go back to our first part of our scripture in Revelation 2, if you go back there, Jesus who walks among the churches, walks amongst the lampstands, walks among these pure gold bodies that are light to the world, Jesus says, I'll remove those lampstands if they do not shine a light. And Jesus tells us what to do. He doesn't, Jesus doesn't say, hey, Ephesus, this is what you got going great, but this thing is not good. He always gives the solution too. So let's jump in there. Back to Revelation 2. Verse five, so Jesus says, here's the answer. And I'd like you to take your pen out, if you're okay with writing in your Bible, I want you to underline three words here. The first one is, remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Underline remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Then next, repent, underline that word, repent, is the next instruction he gives. And then he says, and do the works, underline do the works. Remember, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, Jesus says, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So Jesus says, this is what we do, church, when we're losing our first love. We start with remembering. Remember your first love. Remember what it was like. Get that passion back. Remember when we first walked out of darkness uh, in our lives and into the light. Remember when we first believed that Jesus died for us and gave us new life now and gives us new life in eternity. How that so changed us. Let's go back and remember that. Let's remember that God's love is designed to move through us now as a church to others so they can have the same hope. And he says, repent. It's a simple old school word that means turn. He says, remember this. Remember your first love and then simply turn back towards it. Turn away what that means. Turn away from the things we're worshiping today. Turn away from our overburdened schedules and our worship of the world. Take, just turn away from the things that steal our time and our hearts from Jesus and the community of church.
Remember, turn and go back and do the works. Go back and do the things when you were on fire. Remember, repent, return. Go back to the things we're doing when we were in crazy love with God because of Jesus. Remember and return back to the days we're praying because we just love to talk to God through Jesus. We love to listen to the Holy Spirit. Return to the days when you're driving down the street in your car and you got worship music cranked up and you're acting like a freak in there and people are looking at you kind of weird at every intersection. Return to that. Return to the joy, the fervor, the zealous behavior. Return to community, learning, and loving together because in this community is where we stoke that first love all the time. It's hard to do this on your own. That's why God gave us all of us. And Jesus says there at the end, he says he gives a promise to the one who conquers. He's talking to the church. Jesus said, I conquered the world on the cross with my love. Now go out and conquer the same world through your love. My love that courses through you. To the person who does that, hangs in there, he's talking about becoming part of the family of God in paradise with him, the reward that's at the end for all of us. It's worth it, every moment of what we're doing. So your next sermon note, this is the one that's probably the big idea today. What is mission? Mission is a church's primary identity. This is who we are. Mission is our main thing, every one of us. We exist to expand the love of God to the world. Everything we do as a church, when mission is our primary identity, everything we do as a church is a potential of each person in here extending God's love to the community and the world through you and through all of us together. That is our primary identity. And for that reason is why we do everything else. Because of that mission is why we do small groups. It's why we get into God's word together and stoke that first love. It's why we pray together as a community. It's why we're here right now worshiping and getting inspired to go back out and be the church the rest of the week. Why we do everything is for this identity. It's why we meet together during the week and break bread together and have fellowship and disciple together, understand this good news that's in us so we can share it with others. All this we do so we can go out and build relationships with our neighbors, our coworkers, our fellow students. We introduce them to a savior who loves them, watch their lives change, and invite them right into this community so they can get stoked every week and keep that first love going. And he works through them. So the question would be, we love to compare, how's Westview doing compared to Ephesus? in the year 95 AD. How are we doing in 2022? I say we're doing great. I would say we're doing great. I think there's such a missional heart here. I'm gonna show you what our missional heart is. But I'm gonna tell you, we are not, we have holy discontent. We're never happy until 100% of our people are in the middle of their first love and doing exactly what God's called us to do. That every one of us is on mission that every one of us is a movement of God's love to the world. Now, is that possible to be 100%? Well, I got people who are still trying to figure out who Jesus is here. Well, you know, we're all on that journey, but we want 100% of us, and we will not rest until that happens, that this is our identity. How are we doing at Westview? I'll tell you, it's a daily tension. It's a daily tension to inspire the church to go out and engage the world. It's a daily tension when your schedules are so full and we're trying to give that carving of time for God in prayer and, and falling in love with Jesus and keep that first love going when our schedules are so full with all these other activities. It's a daily tension when we watch news channels all day long and we're scared to death of the world out there. And so we want to hide in here. It's a daily tension to say that is not truth. There is challenge out there. But you got the hope of Christ in you. And we know in this book of Revelation how things finish. It's a daily tension that when we're so tired and we just want to be comfortable and we're trying to push you out of your comfort zone. And it's worth every moment of tension. 
Because when you discover this, you will find a joy and a peace that you'll never find in this world. We're doing good. We want to get everybody going. So I want to share with you, if you are a guest with us or you're online with us the first time, I want to share with you how much we believe this is our identity. It's in our mission statement. It's in our vision statement. We live it. And I want to show you our core values. If you're here today, you're going to see the heart of our church. And this is how our leadership leads and the majority of our people. Our mission statement is just a kind of a rewrite of the Great uh, Commission, which is fueled by the Great Commandment. Reaching and teaching people near and far to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That should be every church's mission, to go out and make disciples. Why do we do that? Because we love God with everything we got and we love our neighbor like ourselves. Our vision statement, kind of mission is what we do all the time. Vision is this is what we're doing for the next so many years. This is our focus. So be bold, love loud, engage deeply. This has a whole strategy plan to it and everything. But let me explain what be bold. We live this every day and we push this and talk about it every day. Be bold means be brave, church. Don't scroll away from a world that's tough. But let's get out and engage it. Love loud. Love loud means we have a language in our lives in the love of Christ that can penetrate all that noise out there. And is there a lot of noise out there? Amen. There's a lot of noise out there. And engage deeply is the unconditional love that we have in each of us, just like Jesus, that we will walk with you. We're there for a relationship, and we aren't going to quit on you. We never give up. And we're going to walk with you and be with you in those toughest places as you awaken to the love of Christ. But we had to take this further. That, that's, that's a good, that's got strategy and everything. If you want to know what that is, I'll, I'll give it to you. We're, we're getting ready to rewrite this a little bit this year because we've been five, six, seven years in this. The next is our core values. We wrote this about a year ago. So God, what are you sending here? Every church, we don't think we're the cat's meow. I want you to just know that right now at Westview. We don't think we're the cat's meow or better than any other church. We're part of Christ's bigger church, but he sends people here and has for years. They're very distinctive of, our, of what God has done through us and what he's doing through us. And so we wrote these core values to say, if you come to Westview, this is what you should expect. The first core value is we go there. It sounds arrogant or cocky, but it's really not. What it means is that we go to the dark places and we bring the light. If you look at our ministries of this church and where our missionaries, nine of them are around the world, sent from our church, from your body, we are in the toughest places in the world. We're not afraid of them, and you got an old paramedic leading you here who's not afraid either. We want people here who are bold. And we want to take, where's, where does the light need to go? The light needs to go in the darkness. The light needs to go to the darkness. So we are unafraid to gauge life in hard places. That comes from Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Second core value, love like Jesus. This sounds like a 70s thing, not. Um, we strive to love others the way Jesus does, filled with gentle truth and abundant grace. And that comes out of John uh, 1.14. We have seen the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. We want both. You need to be full of grace and truth. You need to love like we're supposed to and you need to hold on to those distinctives about who we are as a church. That's what the world needs. Unfortunately, some churches just deal with truth and some just deal with grace and those don't work well without the other. Next one, core value, is uh, walk the talk. We believe in a lifestyle of sacrificial generosity. We believe here that your time, your treasure, your talent feeds this body and reaches the world. We need every one of us. And the more I fall in love with that first love and the more I fall in love with watching somebody else change to new life, the more I'm excited about this place and the more generous I am. If you're struggling with generosity, it might be because you've lost that first love. Because when we see people change, it's one of the most beautiful things you can watch. And we just get more and more generous. It's not, mo just, it's not money. It's your time and your treasure and what you bring to this body that impacts the world. Corinthians 9, 6, 7, remind, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. We want everything you do to here to be out of joy. Last core value, always on. The church is neither a building nor an hour on Sunday. But we are, 
but being the church is expressed in every moment of our lives and every place we go. We are church Monday through Saturday. We come here to inspire, glorify God, and get out there. That's what we do. We're always on. You are representative of Christ. You're always on wherever you go. And how you worship has a big impact. 1 John 3, 18, dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. A lot of people do that. Let us show the truth by our actions. We want to be a church that's always in action. That's who we are. And let me just suggest unapologetically. And if this fits you, we would love you to be here. Because we want to inflame every person in this room to be the transforming love of Christ in the world. That's what the world needs. Last sermon note. Here's your challenge. Hold on to your first love. Hold on to your first love. God built a bridge to us through Jesus. Everybody in this room, God has built a bridge to you through Jesus. And we cross that bridge. We've been forgiven. We've been restored. We've returned back to God. We have new life now. We know where we're going. And now we're joining Jesus and building bridges to others because we want them to know the love of the Father through Jesus. We're building these bridges. You're just not doing them like I did with Marilyn Bloom. We're building good, perfect, solid bridges that never fail. Marilyn, if you are listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm still a little traumatized by the potting soil thing. Week one, we talked about what is mission. Today, what is our mission? Next week, we're answering this question. You're going to love it. Come back. Where is our mission? I think you're going to be surprised. Where is our mission? So, there we go. So, offering is a time of worship we move into to where we say, I have seen your word, I have, and I, I'm ready for this first love thing, and my f way I express my first love is offering. Is how do we give back to God in worship? Because we're so overwhelmed by his love to us through Jesus. Amen? So offering, I'm going to call up these leaders to join me. We're going to do a special offering today. It's a little unique. Um, but the first thing I'll remind you is your offering is if you've lost that first love and you want help, your first offering is help me discover that first love. If you want us to walk alongside you and help discover that first love, write on your connect card. Just write on that. Say, hey, I've lost my first love and want some help. We're going to walk. Just give us a way to reach you. I will tell you next week, if this could be your offering, next week we have that ministry expo. We're going to show you every small group, every way to plug in, every way to stoke your first love. Wayne is leading that next week. The expo will show you every way this church stokes our first love. If you're missing it, come to that. Do not leave this church without walking through all those tables and seeing how we stoke first love. Your offering is your time and treasure and talent. If you have a financial gift today, you can give online. You can drop them in these boxes as you leave. To our guests, that connect card's huge to us. We would love to connect with you. Now that you know who Westview is, we'd love to connect with you. But this is also a special offering. As all, this, as all of our students are heading back and the education institutions are all firing up, which is the lifeblood of our community, um, our offering is, is we're launching out all of our children and all of our graduate students and all of them into the world. They are our lampstand in the education world. And this is a group of leaders from every area of education who is going to help us pray in offering for all the kids, adults, and everybody we're launching out in the world right now. So I'll let them introduce themselves. I'll get away. Good morning. I'm Donna Cranford, and I'm going to be praying for preschool and elementary students this morning. And I've taught um, public school, and I've taught at Flint Hills Christian School for many, many years. And tomorrow I actually start teaching preschool, three- and four-year-olds, so pray for me. <laughs> I'm Dick Nelson. I uh, taught at Manhattan High School for 31 years, and I'll be praying for administrators and teachers in our public schools. I'm Jennifer Altwig, and I'm representing the hundreds of homeschool families we have in the Manhattan area. And uh, this year, I'm part of a new co-op um, on the board for that. I'm Dylan Meyer. I'm the youth pastor here, and this is my wife, um, Olivia. We're going to be praying for a high school and junior high students. My name is Brooklyn Walker, and me and my husband, Shad, actually, our apartment is in the dorms at MCC, so we live with college students. So I'm going to be praying for the college-age students. 
Um, and if you guys want to bow your heads with me, I'll start us in prayer. God, thank you so much um, for the influx of people in Manhattan this last week because that means that we have so many college students in our community. And I just pray for them as they are um, coming in to start college tomorrow. I pray for the first years as they are nervous and scared and not sure how to do this adult thing. And I pray for those who are in their last year of college and having to make real career decisions coming up soon. And I pray for every college student in between those two ends. And I just pray that the decisions they make would be safe and wise and add to who they're going to be in a positive way. I pray that the things of this world would not entice them, that they would um, make choices that are going to be healthy for them. And God, I pray that the people around them would help them to make those wise choices. God, I pray that you would place people in their lives or signs or, or things on social media that will lead them towards you. And I pray that we as a church would um, help in that to be welcoming, to be helpful, to be um, ready to aid in whatever we can. And God, I just pray that they would feel seen and heard and safe and loved um, throughout this next school year. God, I pray that you be with our high school students, be with the students that this is their last year and, and they're praying and, and seeking direction on where they're supposed to go as they move away from high school. God, I pray that you also be with those that are walking into high school for the first time. God, I pray that you be with these students and everywhere in between, that they know that as they walk um, and they wander through life in search of purpose, in search of passion, in search of life, and in search of themselves, that they would know that you are with them and you are guiding them, even in the wilderness, even when they feel like they're lost and they don't know where to go. God, may they know that you are there and your presence is there and, and you are the deepest desire of their hearts. Everything that they're searching for, you have your thumbprint on. Father, create in them new life and new passion that they would seek you and they would find you knowing that you have been seeking them all along. God, be with those that don't know you yet. Create a way, make space in their life for you and for those that know you well. Light a fire in their hearts that they would know you in a new way and they would introduce you and the love that you have to all around them. Lord, we just lift up junior high students as it's just an awkward and sometimes challenging time. Um, God, they're just their developmental stage is trying to find who they are and their independence. And um, we just pray that they find themselves in you, that they don't listen to the world telling them who they are, but they listen to you and who you created them to be and who you want them to be. God, I just pray for the body of the church to be able to just come around and see um, when they're hurting, see when they are just weighed down with the weight of life and that we are able to be your hands and your feet just loving them and just speaking truth in them when they don't know what is true in this world. God, I just pray as um, they just go to school that they can be your light for the ones that do know you and they know they, they can stand on you. And God, for the ones that don't, I just pray for opportunities to listen to you on who you created them to be, who they are in you. Jesus, you are our great leader. You provide us with strength for the entire length of time we are raising our kids. And there's no lack to those who fear you. May we ask for wisdom every time we need it and receive it as little children, utterly dependent on our Father, leaning into you with our whole hearts, not our own understanding. May, be, may we be aware of our times and seasons in homeschooling. Help us discern your will for each season. Help us not be afraid to follow you when it looks different than what we expected or even wanted on a yearly, da daily, and minute-to-minute -minute basis. You are our provider. You provide community and support. Help us to walk in love, honor, and joy in the different communities, co-ops, online groups, with neighbors and friends we're connected to. And we praise you, Father. You never leave us. You see it all, and you know every failure and victory, both parent and child. 
You celebrate with us, laugh and cry with us, and troubleshoot with us. You know the desires of our hearts. Teach us and lead us, Lord, as we choose to delight in you. Lord, we're going to lift up the schools in our community, especially the administrators and teachers in those schools. In Manhattan alone, there are three secondary schools, 10 elementary schools, two early childhood schools. There are 40 or more administrators, over 620 teachers, and a, a lot more um, paraprofessionals. So Lord, we lift up not only these schools in Manhattan, but the surrounding communities that represent even more administrators and teachers. And Lord, we lift them up to you, and we, we know that there are some, many, that call on your name, that know you. And Lord, we ask that they would truly be that golden lampstand in their community, in their school, in their department. Lord, that the, their light would shine in such a way as to give a blessing to the children in their care, the light to the, their colleagues. Lord, be with them and strengthen them. Lord, we also pray for those that don't know you. Lord, whether they know you or not, Lord, that your truth would go forth, that you would be honored in every classroom by every teacher. Lord, work in the hearts of each teacher, each administrator that gives guidance to the school and the teachers. Lord, they need your power and your strength. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And Father, we want to lift up, excuse me, preschool and elementary students, both in public and in private schools. Uh, many public schools started last week, and we know this week uh, many of the preschools and Flint Hills Christian School starts, and so we just pray your blessing over them. Lord, we pray for these young students that you will guard their hearts and their minds and you. We pray a hedge of protection around them as they go into many of them new environments, new classrooms, uh, new fellow students, new teachers. Lord, we pray for courage, um, that they will be courageous going into those new places, that you will give them comfort and that you will give them energy and strength as they adjust to a school schedule again. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would establish solid friendships for them and that they would stand on your truth when confronted with lies and the culture around them. Lord, I pray that each of them, each of these students would come to know you as, a per, in, as personal Lord and Savior at an early age and that they would be plugged into a church and that their families would be teaching truth. Lord, we just thank you so much for all these young minds, these young littles that um, you have such great purpose for and plan for. And guard and protect them in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to continue in this spirit of prayer, but we're going to do it through song. Uh, so we're going to invite you to stand with us. Just a reminder, if you were here today and you've filled out that Connect card, or if you haven't, would you scan the QR code and do that quick? If you haven't filled out, just know that as you exit today, there'll be boxes at each door where you can leave that. Um, we want to continue singing this prayer over our students, our teachers, and those in our community. Oh 
may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you go this morning. We thank you for worshiping with us and we'll see you back here next Sunday.